ever watched a game that had a gigantic reversal of fortune? The Brown, I mean, Browns used to be famous for this in the era of the cardiac kids. You know, the Browns are losing, but in the last seconds of the fourth quarter, the cardiac kids would score two touchdowns and somehow squeak out a win. There have been games when the Indians are behind most of the game and then drive in several home runs, maybe a grand slam right in the ninth end of the, the bottom of the ninth or the yeah at the end of the ninth inning, and you know there's been a couple of those Jeopardy shows. You watch Jeopardy, you know uh, there've been a couple of Jeopardy shows where where one of the contestants is in dead last place, and then all of a sudden sweeps two or three categories, uh, uh, hits a daily double, bets everything, wins. Puts, puts it all on the line in final jeopardy, wins again, and comes from behind, takes home all the prize money. It happens. It's not normal. Uh, Hugh E. Keogh once said, uh, the race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but that's the way to bet. Sometimes the betting pool is wrong. Sometimes the unexpected does happen. Sometimes the underdog wins. And that has everything to do with our stories from Scripture today. We begin in the book of Esther. And this, this is going to take a little bit of explanation because uh, maybe not everybody is familiar with the book of Esther. Um, we begin, we're, we're, we're going to read today from the climax of Esther's story. But prior to where we begin, for a quick summary, Haman, a high-ranking advisor to King Xerxes, convinced the king to sign an edict that would allow everyone in his kingdom to kill any Jew that they found, and if they killed them, take everything that they owned. All right? What Haman didn't know was that King Xerxes' queen, Esther, was a Jew. And she wasn't going to sit idly by while this atrocity played itself out. And so she invited both Haman and the king to dinner. But when they came to her, her banquet, she chickened out. And she couldn't make her big announcement. And, and so she invited them to dinner again the second day. And that's where we join the story in Esther chapter 7. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor, favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life, this is my petition. And spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet. Because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. And Esther said, an adversary and an enemy. This vile Haman. And then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up and left in a rage. He left his wine and went out into the palace garden. Now, that was an unusual phrase for me, and I'm thinking it must be uh, um, the writer of this knew that it was rare for the king to not be together with his wine. For the king and his wine to be separated, this must have been an unusual occurrence. The king left his wine, and he went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. And just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. 
And the king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in my house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs that attended the king, said, A pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits. Now, that's a 75-foot-long pole. That's a big pole, 75 feet long. A pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. And the king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole that he had set up for Mordecai. And then the king's fury subsided. Do, uh, do you know what impaling means in the ancient world? Um, I don't want to be too graphic. Uh, are, are, are these guys okay if I explain what that is a little? It, it, hmm? <laughs> He's not listening. All right. In the ancient world, particularly in Jewish literature, someone who's hung on a tree was known to be cursed. And we always assume that's Jesus on a cross, right? Uh, except what was far more common among their, uh, Israel's enemies was being impaled. And, and we think of that often as being just kind of stuck up on a pike. What it really tended to involve, pardon me, I don't want to offend anybody's sensibilities, but you would take a, 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 a long pole with a sharp pointy end and you'd lift somebody up until their bottom there's, you know, there's a hole on each end of a human being and, until the, 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 it would go in the one end of a human being and kind of set them down on that and let gravity do the rest. And every time they moved, every time they sneezed, every time they breathed, they'd go down a little farther on the pole until eventually it came out the other end. Could take days. Not a pleasant end. This is what Haman had in mind for Esther's uncle, Mordecai, on a 75-foot pole, where obviously in an era before skyscrapers, everybody could see him. And this is the same pole then that Xerxes puts Haman on. Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters oh, <coughs> letter to the Jews throughout the province of, of, uh, provinces of King Xerxes near and far. Great annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow turned to joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. You see, Haman was descended, we think, from a tribe of people by the people of Israel when they fought over and settled into the land that God had given to them. His hatred was for Esther's uncle Mordecai specifically, but also for all Jews everywhere. And his hatred, he, he allowed his hatred to propose something truly evil and make it sound palatable and even convincing to the king. But God... But God had put just the right person in just the right place at just the right moment. Mordecai, earlier in the book of Esther, uh, had told his, his niece that she had been chosen by God for just such a time as this. And suddenly, the tables were turned. Suddenly, the hunter becomes the hunted. And to make matters worse, Haman throws himself at the feet of Queen Esther to beg for 
just at the moment the king returns to the room, and it looks like he's attacking her. Before Haman leaves the room, they think that's like uh, they already blindfolded him or put a, a hangman's hood over his face to signify his sentence of death. He intends to die by being impaled on the same pole with which he intended to kill Mordecai. Now, if you read the rest of the story, King Xerxes, because of the way their law and their legal system works, he's unable to retract his earlier edict, so he instead issues a second edict in which he allows the Jews, wherever they are, to gather together and use whatever force necessary to defend themselves, and if anyone attacks them, then they get to keep their property. The moment that Haman had intended to watch his enemies die became the moment of his own death. And he dies on the pole that he had built for his enemy. In the end, a day that was intended for the destruction of the Jews becomes a great victory for the Jews instead. It's a great reversal of fortune. The unexpected happened. The underdog won. And that type of reversal of fortune is, is sort of common in Scripture. It's common in Scripture because it is the unlikely and the improbable and the outright impossible where we most easily see God at work. But as we read the stories of the New Testament and the Gospels, we also see moments when the unexpected isn't the miracles of God, but the, in the unexpected and expansive grace of God. In Mark chapter 9, the disciples come to Jesus because God has players on the field that aren't on the team that the disciples thought they should be on. Reading from Mark Chapter 9. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name. That's pretty impressive right there. He, he was commanding demons to come out of people in the name of Jesus. And we told him to stop because he wasn't one of us. Don't stop them, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anybody who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And to anyone who causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him with a large millstone tied uh, to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. There we go. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and go to hell where the fire never goes out. And, and if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire that's a weird sentence, but we're going to explain that a little bit. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and 
be at peace with one another. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. First off, Jesus does the unexpected. Because he tells his disciples that there are others who follow Jesus. There are others who are performing miracles in Jesus' name, but who are not among the 12 disciples and who are not among the followers that are the followers of the 12 disciples. They're not many of the people that the disciples know. And the disciples are confused because, because how can these guys be followers of Jesus if they're not, well, I don't know, following Jesus? But Jesus says that anybody who preaches the gospel is not the enemy. Moreover, anybody who does good in the name of Jesus will be rewarded by God. Conversely, Jesus says that God will punish those who do things that cause others, even children, to go astray. We all know, many of us from painful experience, it's, that it's better to shut up and be silent than to say something stupid. Right? It's better to shut up than say something stupid. Um, and Jesus is making this same sort of point uh, in a considerably more graphic way. Um, he says it's better to lose a hand or a foot or an eye than to suffer in hell. So, um, even though doing the will of God and following the example and teaching of Jesus may occasionally be inconvenient to us, Sometimes following Jesus may be painful to us. It may be financially costly to us to do the things that Jesus has taught us to do. Being inconvenienced, Jesus says, is far better than being condemned to hell. Jesus says everyone will be salted with fire. And that is a weird phrase until we take it apart. The best way to understand it is to remember that gifts to God in the ancient world, the gifts to God for the ancient Jews, when the temple was still standing, gifts to God were burned on the altar. And so what Jesus is saying is that our inconveniences in following him, the sacrifices that we make because we're following his rules, the trials that we endure, the pain that we suffer in the name of Jesus, those things are sacrifices that burn on the altar before God and which ultimately purify us. But what is that thing about salt not being salty? Remember another well-known passage of Scripture, Matthew chapter 5, says this, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and hide it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see the good deeds, see your good deeds, and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, if we take these scriptures all together, they tell us that the sacrifices that we make in order to follow Jesus, the inconveniences that we experience, the suffering that we endure, these are the things that make us different from the people around us. 
These are the things that reveal the works. Of, these are the unexpected things, right? These are the things that reveal the works of God to the world around us. These are the things that make us the salt of the earth. And if we lose our saltiness, if we become just like everybody else, if we look and act just like everybody else, then we've lost our saltiness. We've lost any ability that we had to change our culture, to change our world for the better. Those are lessons that are unexpected. And why is all this important? Why do we want to be salted with fire? Why do we want to be a, a, a salt of the earth? Why do we want to be a, a light to, in the darkness? Why do we want to change the world? In James chapter 5, we have the answer. James says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. That whole passage is full of the miraculous and the unexpected. Uh, uh, he starts off by saying a prayer to an invisible, unseen God whose temple doesn't even have an idol in it. And if you pray a prayer like that to this invisible, unseen God without an idol, that prayer has the power to heal the sick. James says, go ahead and expose yourself. Not, not without clothes. No, 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 not like that. James says, expose yourself to ridicule and potential pain by confessing your sins in public among believers so that you can be healed. That's unexpected. James says we do all these things so that one life might be changed. All of this is worthwhile. A multitude of sins can be erased if just one person is rescued from death and returns to the ways of God. That is the ultimate reversal of fortune. The sinner condemned to death repents, returns to God, and is saved. Life comes from death. The world is changed for the better. One life at a time. And all of that happens because the followers of Jesus Christ are willing to lay their comfort and their convenience, their pain and their suffering on the altar and give it to God. When we are willing to live our lives differently than the people around us, when we are willing to live our lives differently than the culture around us, 
when we are willing to be salty, it is then that we can be seen. It's then that the world and the people around us can see God at work in us. It's then that we are able to change the world one life at a time and be a part of God's greatest reversal of fortune ever, rescuing the lost, restoring the condemned, literally bringing life out of death. That is certainly worth a little inconvenience and suffering. Our inconvenience, our pain, our suffering in the name of Jesus is the salt that will change the world. Don't ever be afraid to be salty. Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. Amen.